Hi, this is Beth Faber at the Hydrologic Engineering Center, and this is the second video of the prospect course number 209, which is risk-based analysis using the FDA software. And lecture 3.6 is the uncertainty in exceedance probability functions or frequency curves, right? This section is on what's called in this lecture, the observation approach for estimating flow frequency curves, right? This is fl flow frequency analysis based on a gauge record. So stream flow measurement is done by measuring the stage of flow and then transforming that stage into a flow, generally using a rating curve or a relationship between flow and stage. So often the agency that is gauging the stream will um, at various different flow levels, will go out into the stream, divide up into uh, areas, cross-sectional areas, and measure the velocity in each. And so for each area, they can multiply the velocity times the area and get flow, and then add up those flows across the stream, right? So that will be one flow measurement for one stage. And they'll go out and do that for various different stages to get a flow estimate for each. Now at high stages that maybe they haven't observed, maybe they'll use some hydraulic modeling to help estimate the flow, okay? So the agency that does the most stream flow measurement in the United States is the US Geological Survey. And they have about 30,000 sites in their program. They check their data for quality and then archive it and make it available to us for download through their website. And also HUC software generally has links right to the, H, uh, to the USGS website to allow you to download their data directly. Right? So then statistical analysis of annual peak uh, stream flow observations from a site can be used to produce a flow frequency curve. Right. There are several types of uncertainty in this type of analysis. We already looked at one of them, okay? but let's look at a few here. We've got measurement uncertainty. So maybe we have inaccurate measurement of the stream stage. We have transform uncertainty, right? So maybe our flow stage rating curve for transforming that stage into a flow rate isn't quite right. We have the sampling uncertainty, which we just spent about 15 minutes talking about. Um, the history of observations may not describe the variability of stream flow well. The record may be too short or just unrepresentative. And then we have model uncertainty. Maybe the log Pearson type three distribution is not the best fit for that particular site, right? So we've already looked at the sampling error, but let's take another look at it in a way that shows us how we might estimate uncertainty for any given sample size, right? So this is very similar to what we did in the motivation slides, where we're starting with a known probability distribution and doing some random sampling, but now we're gonna limit it to random samples of a given size, so we can look at the uncertainty specifically from samples of that size. So the pink curve is our known distribution, and we're gonna sample um, 30 flows at a time. Right, so we've generated 30 random numbers between zero and one. Uh, each of them is assumed to be a cumulative probability. We put it on the horizontal axis and go up to the curve to read a flow value. Then we're gonna take these 30 values and treat it like a 30 member data set, right? So here we've got those 30 values uh, assigned plotting positions uh, based on a 30 year record. So this largest point, which was actually a one in 250 year event, uh, is instead assumed one in 30. If we look up here to return period on the top, because it's the largest event in the 30 years. Now we fit the same probability distribution to it. So this is the log Pearson type three distribution that I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. And this is a possible incorrect estimate of this distribution based on a 30 year sample, right? So I'm gonna hold on to that distribution, but I'm gonna make another 30 year random sample, right? Here's a different 30 year random sample. The largest event in this case was smaller than a one in 30 year event, but again, it's assumed to be a one in 30 year event and a frequency curve is fit. In this case, the one that's a bit lower than the actual curve, right? Here's one more random sample and the distribution that's fit to it. If I do this a few hundred times and plot all of the estimated frequency curves together, it looks something like this, all right? So here's our original distribution in pink in the middle. And here are many different frequency curves that are estimated using random 30 member samples. And we can see that the spread can be pretty wide. It's the narrowest in the center, right? Because it's easiest to estimate the middle of a probability distribution. And it gets pretty wide at the tails, at the high end 
and at the low end. Right? Here's a representation of that uncertainty. Right? These curves are plotting out uncertainty that looks about like this. So remember these PDFs come out of the screen right, on a z-axis. And if we want to span that middle 90% to make confidence intervals, we're going to cover 90% of the area and plot confidence intervals moving down the curve. Right? So these are confidence intervals for a sample of size 30. So we can repeat this experiment for more data. Right? This is 30 years. Let's do it again for 60 years. Right? So here's 30. If I click to the next slide, here's 60 years. Right? Back to 30. And here's 60 years. So every curve is a little bit closer. Right? Every one of the estimates is a better estimate right? because it had twice as much data. The uncertainty is narrower. The confidence interval has gotten narrower. Right? Let's double the data again. Let's go from 60 to 120. Right? Here's 120 years. Okay? It, gets, it gets narrower yet. Right, 60, back to 30, 30, oops, 60, and 120, right? So the uncertainty gets a lot narrower when we have two and then four times as much data, but looking at the 1% event, that's still quite wide, right? This is log space up here. So this is going from about um, 150 to 300,000 CFS uh, as a confidence interval of the 1% event. So we've just done experiments that help us describe how much uncertainty we have in estimating a probability distribution from a limited sample. But what do we do with this? Well, we, we now know how wide to draw confidence intervals around a frequency curve that we estimate with actual data. Right? We, esti we have some data set. We estimate a frequency curve from it. And based on how much data we had or the record length, we know how wide to draw our confidence intervals. Right, so that's what this type of experimentation is done for us. So let's summarize what's called the observation approach in this lecture. So we have federal guidance for how to estimate a flow frequency curve from gauge stream flow data. Right, the current version of the guidance is called Bulletin 17B that was published in 2018. The previous version of the guidance was Bulletin 17B and that was published in 1982. So both versions of the guidance recommend fitting a log Pearson type 3 distribution to the annual maximum flows. They recommend f using this approach only for unregulated flows. And overall, this approach can only be used when a frequency curve is only needed for the gauge site, right? not for other sites nearby. So the assumptions of the analysis uh, I mentioned earlier when talking about the motivation experiment, we assume that the data is what's called IID, which stands for independent and identically distributed. So that means floods from each year are statistically independent. Climate and watershed characteristics affecting the flow runoff are unchanged for the entire record. Okay, that refers to the data being stationary or homogeneous. And that means that we can assume the floods are all coming from the same probability distribution or are identically distributed. And of course, we need to make that assumption if we're going to use all those flows as a sample to estimate one probability distribution. Okay. Finally, we assume that the record length is long enough to describe the population of floods. Now, really, we know this isn't true, and we're going to incorporate the fact that it's not true by recognizing the uncertainty. Okay. Now, Bulletin 17C can address uh, a few challenges in data like low outliers, uh, zero flows, uh, missing data. Okay? It can also incorporate historical and paleo information. So when there's some evidence of uh, large floods or maybe the absence of large floods before the gauge record, and it also can use regionalization of the skew coefficient. All right, so here's a summary of the method. Uh, as I mentioned, the log Pearson type three distribution is used for the annual maximum flows. The LP3 distribution has been reparameterized to use mean, standard deviation, and skew as the parameters. If you look up log Pearson type 3 in a textbook, you'll see other parameters, maybe alpha, beta, and psi. But when it was chosen for the guidance, they reparameterized it to make it more convenient to work with. Now, in Bulletin 17C, the parameters are estimated using a procedure called the expected moments algorithm. This is still a version of the method of moments where we estimate the moments of the distribution from the moments of the sample, meaning the mean, standard deviation, and skew. But the expected moments algorithm uh, is a little bit more like the maximum likelihood estimation technique. Right? So it does a little bit of a better job, especially in situations where we have non-standard data. 
right? So when we have um, estimates of flow that are better captured by intervals due to uncertainty in the measurements, right? Uh, does better with low outliers, also called potentially influential low floods in the new guidance. Uh, zero flows and missing values. So zero flows are difficult because um, this is a log distribution and there is no log of zero. Um, but in the um, in the arid southwest, sometimes uh, there won't be any stream flow for the entire year. And so the annual peak is zero. Okay? It also better incorporates those historical or paleo flood uh, estimates that come before the gauge record. Right? And finally, it gives a better estimate of uncertainty. 17C will give a better estimate of uncertainty than 17B. It incorporates the uncertainty in the skew coefficient, right? which bulletin 17B did not do. Unfortunately, that will give us wider uncertainty because the skew coefficient is quite uncertain. So to go about performing this analysis, the original guidance uh, showed you how to do it by hand. These days, we can bring our data into uh, software like uh, HEC's SSP. There's a bulletin 17 module, and we can select 17B or 17C analysis. Now that the guidance is formalized, uh, well, let's pick 17C. We've got a page for um, putting in not just the flow record. Well, we import the flow record, and it'll show up in this table down here. It'll let us put high and low estimates for a given flow uh, value if we have some uncertainty about it. And it also requires a different type of information than we needed before called perception thresholds. And perception thresholds are a description of the range in which we'd be able to observe a flow, right? So during the gauge record over on this end, the perception thresholds are um, zero to infinity, meaning we would see any flow that occurs because we have a gauge. But here we have a period where we have a historical event here back in 1851. And in the period since 1851, we want some kind of estimate for what the flow is. Now we've seen that we can observe a flow of 65,000 because it did somehow get recorded. And in the years since uh, 1851 until the gauge was put in place, we didn't see another flow that large. So my perception threshold says I would have seen something over 65,000. So if I didn't see anything, then it must have been something less than 65,000, right? So the computation puts in a flow interval of 0 to 65,000 for those unobserved flows. Right? When we hit compute, SSP will offer us uh, computation of the log Pearson type 3 distribution. So a mean, a standard deviation, a skew, and it will also offer an equivalent record length. Right? So if there were no historical information or low outliers, the equivalent record length is just the record length. Um, if we have historical information, though, it might be a little bit higher because we brought in some more information. With low outliers, maybe it goes down a little bit because there was some data that we couldn't use completely. All right, so we have a mean, standard deviation, and skew, and an equi equivalent record length that's going to help us describe the uncertainty. It will also give us a plot of the flow frequency curve. Then we'll take those parameters over to FDA. All right, here's how we enter our frequency curve and our uncertainty information into FDA. So here's the FDA window. We have the, I guess, hydrologic and hydraulic engineering menu, the hide end menu. We're going to choose exceedance probability functions with uncertainty. They'll call up this window. And when choosing between analytical and graphical, we're going to hit the analytical button. Right? That's going to call up this window. Right? We're going to choose enter log Pearson type 3 statistics. And then we're going to enter the mean, standard deviation, and skew that we estimated for the log Pearson type 3 distribution here. And then we're going to describe our uncertainty in that flow frequency curve by including an equivalent record length, which was also offered by SSP. And again, it's either the actual record length when there's no non-standard data, or it might be something slightly different uh, estimated by SSP, right? if we do have historical information or low outliers. Right? So we have the best, we, we have the estimate of the median curve, and we have the estimate of the uncertainty. After this uh, window is entered, we're going to see exceedance probability versus discharge, right? So this is the calculation of the LP3 curve with this, uh, with these parameters. And then based on the equivalent record length, we're going to get a 90% confidence interval 
and a 50% confidence interval calculated. If we hit the plot button, we'll see the median curve in red and the 90% confidence interval plotted. All right, the way it's labeled is describing the fact that for this uncertainty, we've got a 95 chance that the curve is higher than the green and a 5% chance that the curve is higher than the blue and a 90% chance that the curve is between the two. Now we saw in lecture 2.3, but we'll talk again, about how FDA will randomly create a new log Pearson type 3 frequency curve for each realization. Right? So FDA will do a random selection of two of the three parameters. It's going to select a new mean and a new variance or standard deviation for each realization. And then it will generate a new LP3 curve based on that new mean and that new variance or standard deviation and the original skew. So this will give us uh, possible frequency curves that are higher or lower than the original and that are either steeper or less steep than the original based on changing the mean and changing the standard deviation. They will all have the same curvature as the original because they use the same skew. Now this method is producing uncertainty that's consistent with Bulletin 17b, right, which did not consider the uncertainty in skew. This is not consistent with Bulletin 17c yet because Bulletin 17c's uncertainty does consider the uncertainty in skew. So a future version of FDA will instead re-estimate the LP3 frequency curves with the method I showed for estimating the uncertainty based on a particular sample size. Remember I took the known distribution, or in this case the entered distribution, and randomly sampled values from that curve and then refit a new curve using a new mean standard deviation skew. FDA will use that approach in the future to become consistent with Bulletin 17C. Okay, so that is the observation approach or the flow frequency analysis approach. If you have questions about what I've covered in this video, please go to the discourse site and type in those questions. I'll try to be there to answer them. And in the next video, we'll move on to the hydrologic modeling approach.